Now, in addition to Grasshopper being a parametric modeling environment, it also belongs to the paradigm of visual programming. So really, Grasshopper is a visual programming editor that's integrated with Rhino's 3D modeling tools. Bottom right, you can get a sense of what that visual programming might actually be like, connecting the inputs and outputs of objects with wires in order to facilitate manual modeling. So visual programming is really any programming language that allows users to create programs by manipulating program elements graphically rather than by specifying them textually. Here on the left, you can see maybe the most extreme difference between a node-based or visual programming environment and other forms of modeling. In this case, a syntax-bound environment in RhinoScript, where the text on the left, or code, amounts to the same thing that you see on the right in the node-based collection of objects. One thing to note is that at the bottom of the code, there is an else dot dot dot. So this really only represents about half of the, um, the Rhino script required to yield the same result as what we see on the right. Now both generate the same thing, which is a field of sine curves that could be used at a later point in time to do something like construct a surface. But the important thing to note is that not so much the output being different being relevant, but rather how you get to that output being different, which is very relevant. Both tools have a very different sensibility. So a visual program then is really a node-based and explicit environment where the connectivity network or wires are a representation of the model dependencies. So that icon once rendered as it would look in Grasshopper, you can see is really a line formed between two points, a start and an end point. Now one thing to keep in mind is that in the beginning, Grasshopper was actually not called Grasshopper. It was called Explicit History. This is an important thing to pay, pay note of pay attention to. If we bounce over to Rhino and I close Grasshopper, we can take a look at why it may have been called explicit history. This may be something that you've played with before, but if you notice down at the bottom of Rhino's user interface, there is a little button that says record history. Now before selecting that, I'm going to go ahead and draw a curve in Rhino. I'll turn on record history, select the curve, and use an extrude command. If I turn on the control points of my curve, I can see that now the surface will update with changes that occur to the curve. What we've done here is capture the transaction file of the surface extrusion coming from this curve. That type of history is referred to as implicit history. The surface is implied from the curve, and therefore it will inherit all the properties of the curve. If changes occur to the curve input, the surface will update to reflect those changes. However, if, for instance, I go into front view and I contour through my surface, and make changes to my input curve, I can see that my surface will update, but my curves will not. So the surface is related to the curve. The surface came from the curve, but the contours coming from the surface are not connected to the curve. So the record history, although a very nice tool, is capable of only capturing 
or retaining the inheritance of one level deep worth of history, or that kind of history which is implicit. So David Rutten, the creator or author of Grasshopper, saw this as being a little bit of a problem for people who want to use history or parametrics in design projects. Now you can notice that one thing you might notice is that explicit history um, looks quite a bit like Grasshopper, although there were something in the uh, grid up here that you can see it says generation zero, one, two, three, to begin to talk about this idea of capturing history. Now, this is what Grasshopper looks like today. Well, at least this is what it looked like a few weeks ago. It is changing pretty quickly. So let's go back over to Rhino now and type in Grasshopper once more. Now, one thing you'll notice is that when you type in Grasshopper, you will have a window that is floating in front of Rhino. This window is not dockable, so if you try to dock it um, into Rhino, uh, you're not going to have any luck there. It has a blue Windows bar at the top, which you can use to double-click and collapse the Grasshopper window. It has an X to close the window. If you want to get it back, just type in Grasshopper into the command line. You are able to minimize and drag the window around. If you notice, if you double-click on the window bar once again, this will minimize back to the last location wherever you had it. And you can maximize the window by clicking the Maximize icon. Now what I'd like to do before we even get started too much is look at how we might be able to divide our viewport to increase the usability and functionality of Grasshopper. I typically will divide my screen into two, where I have the Rhino environment here and the Grasshopper environment here. The reason why is because as you begin to model in Grasshopper, remember that it's a visual programming environment. Therefore, whatever you're seeing in Grasshopper and modeling in Grasshopper will just be displayed live in Rhino. If, for instance, you have a Grasshopper window in front of Rhino, you're going to miss out on all the action as it's taking place. So I'm just going to move that back and maximize Grasshopper for a moment. Now, the editor layout. You notice here at the top of Grasshopper, you have File, Edit, View, Display, Solution, and our good friend Help. The Grasshopper support link at the very top will be very useful for you. If I go ahead and click on that and open up the forum, I can see here that there are tutorials, download, a gallery of work, a home button, for instance, and a way to search Grasshopper if I run into a problem. How do I loft? The search results will return a series of queries where perhaps someone has asked the same question before or someone has posted a tutorial. Below the main window navigation here at the top, you'll notice that you also have below a series of tabs. We'll get back to what these tabs are and what they contain in just a moment. But let's go back up here again to the Windows main navigation. If you notice, there's File, and from File, you have New Document, Open Document, as well as a way to open up recent files that you've had opened and been working on. Now we're going to pause there for a second. And why don't you go ahead and hit New Document and take a look at what happens to the screen. Now you may have noticed that 
when you said file new, the viewport changed slightly. Before we had a queue that said no document loaded. Either add a new component or say file new. So we said file new. If we were to go to file save, one thing to note is that Grasshopper has its very own file type. That file type is .gh. Now that's very important because if you notice, if you were to be in Rhino and go file save, the extension here is .3dm. Now what that maybe hints is that Grasshopper is a different file type and therefore needs to be saved separately from any files that you're actually working on in Rhino. So file coordination and naming will be something that we'll try to pay attention to today in order to make sure that we understand that the Grasshopper file lives in a folder that needs to be accessible to any Rhino file that might be referenced. Now, let's go ahead and take a quick look at how to go to the canvas area, which is what this gridded area is referred to here, and begin to drop a few objects on. Now, if you notice, right below the file menus, you have a series of tabs. These tabs contain all of the objects that you can use in Grasshopper. I have a few more than you do, probably, uh, but only because I've added a few things to Grasshopper to make it a little more functional. So why don't you take a moment to drag and drop a few objects onto the canvas. You can do that by going to a menu, using the drop down, and holding down your left mouse button to drag an object onto the canvas. Be sure to check out some of the objects under input, like the panel, the slider. You'll notice there is a control knob, as well as a toggle button on and off. Take a moment to look through the curve menu and see if any of these objects have names that you might be familiar with from Rhino. There's a vector tab, sets, as well as math. So we're going to pause for just a couple of seconds here so that you guys can have a moment to drag a few objects down and take a look at what they look like. One thing you might also note is that the grasshopper panels are separated into different tabs based on the types of objects and the, the types of tasks that those objects perform. Any objects related to curves would be located in the curve tab, surfaces in the surface tab, meshes in the mesh tab, and so forth. If you've brought an object onto the canvas and you would like to remove it, select that object and hit delete. You can select multiple objects by holding down shift. You may delete multiple objects. And control Z will undo. Control Y will redo. Undo and redo can also be found from the edit menu. Undo delete and in my case, redo delete. If you notice, any command which has a hotkey will be listed in the menu with its hotkey. So I'm going to delete both of these objects. If I go to File, Close, Unnamed, I'm not going to save this. You'll notice that we're back to where we started. No document is loaded. One thing to keep in mind right now is that in Grasshopper, this area that we're seeing that says no document loaded is referred to the, as the canvas. The idea behind this is that it is just that, a blank canvas or a sketch pad. It's the modeling space where you create visual programs. But the beautiful thing 
is that it's not cluttered by any kind of interface. So as you have an idea for a design model, you can essentially just drop objects into this blank space and begin modeling. Now, of course, that can be a, a benefit as well as uh, can be a little double-edged sword here. Because of the fact that there's no interface, there's not a lot to get in your way. But because there's no interface, it can become very cluttered very quick. Now, 